War and Revolution, Section, Western Fundamentalism and the Ideology of War. With a long history behind them, celebration of the West as the privileged or exclusive site of civilization and claims for white or Western supremacy on a global scale culminated in Nazi ideology. The collapse of the Third Reich and the worldwide flaring of anti-colonial revolution led to serious impairment, but not the disappearance, of the ethnological racial paradigm for interpreting historical processes and of the exalted exclusivist sense of the West as an island of civilization surrounded by an ocean of barbarism. In 1953, Churchill called upon the West to support the presence of British in the Suez Canal, quote, in order to prevent a massacre of white people, end quote. Three years later, despite the disagreement that had arisen between Washington and London in the meantime, Eisenhower cautioned that, with the nationalization of the Suez Canal, Nasser was intent on, quote, slapping the white man down. Clearly, as far as the two statesmen were concerned, the Arabs belonged to the populations of color, and for that reason, regardless of their political conduct, were alien to civilization and the West. On other occasions, we have seen Churchill stressing the vanguard role that the white English-speaking peoples, or the English-speaking world, were called upon to play in confronting the peril represented by communism and rebellious colonial peoples. Here, the reference to skin color tends to be attenuated or to disappear. The stress is placed on language. Yet we must remember that the British statesmen proceeded no differently from supporters of the Aryan mythology. What was inferred from the linguistic community was the unity of the race underlying it, and the cultural products of the Aryan languages, or the English language, were adduced as evidence of the excellence of that race. Even in our day, a prominent British intellectual, Robert Conquest, has identified the true West as the English-speaking community, to be distinguished not only from barbarians utterly foreign to the West, but also from continental Europe, which has invariably been, quote, a source of bureaucracy and bureaulatry, of rejection of the Anglo-American concept of law and liberty, of anti-Americanism, end quote, and made it clear that the excellence of the English-speaking countries, possesses a specifically Anglo-Celtic ethnic basis. The Anglo-Celtic mythology outlined here recalls the Aryan mythology of ill repute. There is only one clarification to be made. Cherished by a long tradition that developed on both sides of the Atlantic, and then issued into Nazism, Aryan mythology tended to be identified with the white mythology. At all events, it paid tribute to the Nordic peoples and all the peoples that had started out from German soil, hence including the British and Americans. By contrast, the Anglo-Celtic community celebrates its superiority even over continental Europe. The club of genuinely civilized peoples dear to conquest is even more exclusive than that celebrated by Aryan mythology. The racial or ethnological racial paradigm can assume a more or less attenuated form. The most famous theoretician of the clash of civilizations today poses a question. Why, in addition to Europe, the USA, and Canada, do Australia and New Zealand form part of Western civilization, whereas Mexico and Brazil, which are located not in Asia but in the Western Hemisphere, are excluded from it. How are we to explain such inclusions and exclusions? Samuel P. Huntington responds with great clarity, quote, Latin American civilization incorporates indigenous cultures, which did not exist in Europe and were effectively wiped out in North America and in Australia and New Zealand, end quote. To be precise, what, in addition to cultures, were swept away, were the peoples embodying them. 
the famous political scientist, does not conceal the fact. The Puritan colonists who landed in North America worked on the assumption that, quote, expulsion and or extermination of the Indians were the only policies to follow in the future, end quote. Surprisingly, there is an undeniable similarity with Hitler's way of arguing when he explained the infinite superiority of the USA, in his view, an integral part of the West and the Germanic world, over Latin America, completely alien to the West. Let us read Mein Kampf, beginning of long quote. Historical experience offers countless proofs of this. It shows with terrifying clarity that in every mingling of Aryan blood with that of lower peoples, the result was the end of the cultured people. North America, whose population consists in by far the largest part of Germanic elements, who mixed but little with the lower colored peoples, shows a different humanity and culture from Central and South America, where the predominantly Latin immigrants often mixed with the Aborigines on a large scale. By this one example, we can clearly and distinctly recognize the effect of racial mixture. End of long quote. Naturally, there is no question of equating positions that should not be confounded. But we do want to signal the danger of sliding into the ethnological racial paradigm, starting from a paradigm, the clash of civilizations, that intends to be and is different. Civilizations have a real existence, which does not refer to skin color or race. If, however, rather than being understood on the basis of determined historical conflicts, they are regarded as the expression of a quasi-eternal spirit or soul, then civilization, like race, tends to refer to a mythical nature. It is no accident that celebration of the Western soul Abenländische Seele, plays an essential role in Oswald Spengler and in the reactionary German culture that flowed into Nazism. And it is no accident if, in the view of Alfred Rosenberg, the Third Reich's main theoretician, the soul is race seen from within, just as race is the external side of a soul. We can understand Toynbee's warning in the 1950s against persistent Western race feeling. An essentialist vision of civilization and Western fundamentalism are even more marked in Ferguson. In his work, the eternal moral and political primacy of the West becomes a dogma. True, he criticizes as nonsense the thesis dear to American white supremacists subsequently adopted by the Nazis, that, quote, segregation was the key reason why the United States had prospered, while the mongrel peoples of Latin America were mired in poverty, end quote. However, completely ignoring history and geopolitics, he considers but one side of the coin of American liberty and arrives at this conclusion. The difference in economic and political development between the North and the South of the American continent can be explained by the fact that the revolution led by Washington was, quote, the most successful revolution ever made in the name of liberty, while Bolivar's dream turned out to not be democracy, but dictatorship, end quote. We are once again referred to nature, albeit that the indicated nature is not race this time, but the sick psychology of the Latin American leader and his followers. We should not forget that the ethnologico-racial paradigm readily intermingled with the psychopathological paradigm in Nazism. The nature of an order based on healthy racial hierarchy was to be defended against the assault of barbarians or inferior races. Ethnologico-racial paradigm, on the one hand, and against mass subversion inside the citadel of civilization, by those fostering insane ideas of equality and leveling, psychopathological paradigm, on the other. Not by chance, 
Hitler boasted of having detected the Judeo-Bolshevik virus as the source of the revolt of inferior races. Ferguson is aware of the fact that anti-Semitism and rabid hatred of the Jewish race in interwar Poland and, above all, in Nazi or incipiently Nazi Germany, was imbued with the conviction that salvation lay in eradicating a virus or bacillus lethal to society. Quote, As one Polish politician put it, the Jewish community was a foreign body dispersed in our organism so that it produces a pathological deformation. End quote and a sort of Polish poem expressed itself in similar terms in 1922. Quote, Jewry is contaminating Poland thoroughly. It poisons the spirit. A terrible gangrene has infiltrated our body. End quote. Yet, not many pages prior to this, the British historian writes, beginning of long quote, Two epidemics swept the world in 1918. One was Spanish influenza. As if to mock the efforts of men to kill one another, the virus spread rapidly across the United States and then crossed to Europe on the crowded American troop ships. The other epidemic was Bolshevism, which for a time seemed almost as contagious and ultimately proved as lethal as the influenza. End of long quote. The Judeo-Bolshevik virus that fueled the anti-Semitic and anti-communist campaign in the interwar years, and which was Hitler's particular obsession, is now configured as the Bolshevik influenza. Once again, there is no question of equating very different political and ideological positions. Instead, it is a matter of cautioning against the naturalistic connotations peculiar to the psychopathological paradigm and the latter's tendency to cross over into the ethnologico-racial paradigm. Tocqueville identified the French and, in particular, the Jacobins as the carriers of a virus of a new and unknown kind, which allegedly underlay the incessant French revolutionary cycle. Having condemned resentiment as the motive behind rebellion against the power exercised by the masters and the successful, Nietzsche pointed to the Jews as, quote, the people of resentiment par excellence. Finally, Hitler prided himself on having finally discovered the source of the disease and the revolutionary infection. It was Jews and Bolsheviks who were regularly equated, in part on account of the Jewish origin of a significant number of leaders of the Russian revolutionary movement. The process of ethnicization of the revolutionary virus can assume very different forms. But what remains constant is the danger of slippage from the psychopathological paradigm, which refers to mental illness, to the naturalistic paradigm, which refers to the inferior or degenerate ethnicity and race. Ferguson's positions are disturbing for another reason. Visiting the United States in the late 19th century, when the racial state was more robust than ever, and the regime of white supremacy rampant in the South. Friedrich Ratzel, the first theoretician of the Lebensraum, cherished by Nazism, drew attention to the complete failure of the project of constructing a society based on the principle of racial equality. Where was the emancipation of the blacks? subject to lynching and interminable torture staged as a mass spectacle for applauding crowds, the fate of the ex-slaves was perhaps even worse than in the past. On closer inspection, the situation created in the North American Republic, quote, avoids the form of slavery, but retains the essence of subordination, of social hierarchy on a racial basis, end quote. It continued to recognize the principle of racial aristocracy. The conclusion was obvious, quote, experience teaches us to recognize racial differences, end quote. They had proved much more enduring than the, quote, abolition of slavery, which will one day seem a mere episode and abortive endeavor, end quote. 
a reversal had occurred vis-a-vis the fond illusions of abolitionists and fanatics for the idea of equality. The impact of all this would be felt far beyond the United States. Quote, we are only just beginning to see the results this reversal will produce in Europe, even more than in Asia. End quote. This was a prediction and wish of deadly lucidity. The racial state became a trend with the Third Reich, but also, to different degrees and in different ways, with the Empire of the Rising Sun and Mussolini's Empire. Today, it is not difficult to point to the tragic condition of a considerable number of newly independent countries and peoples. But what does this prove? Simply that the process of emancipation, in the case of slaves as in that of colonial peoples in general, is long and tortuous. After the American Civil War, no longer slaves am chattels, subject to sale and purchase like any other commodity, African Americans did not thereby become free. As regards colonial peoples, the conquest of political independence does not betoken liberation from the domination exercised by informal empire. Or, in Lenin's words, to put an end to economic annexation, it is not enough to shake off political annexation. But neither the former slaves nor the former colonies aspire to return to the status quo ante, or feel nostalgia for slavery or colonial subjugation. Ferguson tirelessly proclaims the failure, if not of the abolitionist revolution, then of the anti-colonialist revolution. Furthermore, he regards the principle of the equality of nations, if not that of racial equality, as utterly refuted by historical experience. For this reason, he repeatedly stresses the need for a theoretical and political turn. Quote, I am fundamentally in favor of empire. Indeed, I believe that empire is more necessary in the 21st century than ever before. End quote. Thus, successive neocolonial wars are legitimized and hallowed. Where will it all end? To achieve a new order based on explicit denial of the principle of the equality of nations, the British historian believes one must be prepared to pay an extremely high price. How many deaths did the war in Vietnam cause? In 2004, a conservative French newspaper calculated that, 30 years after the end of hostilities, there were still 4 million victims whose bodies were suffering the ravages of the Terrible Agent Orange, named after the color of the dioxin unsparingly sprayed by U.S. planes on a whole people. The same year, Ferguson criticized the USA for having capitulated, quote, On balance, Americans preferred the irresponsibilities of weakness, end quote. What provides particular food for thought is Ferguson's assessment of the Korean War. In 1951, Truman rejected MacArthur's proposal to drop 50 atomic bombs on Chinese cities. However, stresses Ferguson, in January of the following year, it was the president himself who entertained a similar plan. The USSR and China were to be sent an ultimatum, and, in the absence of a positive response within 10 days, all-out war would have to be launched. Quote, It means that Moscow, St. Petersburg, Mukden, Vladivostok, Peking, Shanghai, Port Arthur, Darin, Odessa, Stalingrad, and every major manufacturing plant in China and the Soviet Union will be eliminated. As we know, things turned out differently, and Ferguson does not seem altogether content with it. Beginning a long quote. By overruling MacArthur, Truman and the chiefs of staff had unwittingly prolonged the war for more than two years. By the time the armistice was signed, on July the 27th, 1953, more than 30,000 American servicemen had lost their lives. 
The United States in 1951 had both the military capability and the public support to strike a decisive military blow against Maoist China. Many another imperial power would have been unable to resist the window of opportunity afforded by America's huge lead in the atomic arms race. End of long quote. In his time, Gandhi referred to Hitlerism, or conversion to Hitler's method, a propos of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But the plans pressed by MacArthur and entertained by Truman, from which the revisionist historian is careful not to distance himself, went far beyond the two atomic bombs that sealed the end of the Second World War, and possibly the start of the Cold War. Let us be quite clear. It is not a question of conjuring up the specter of the Fourth Reich. The historical process is quite distinct from any eternal return of the same. But the extraordinary success enjoyed by Ferguson and his imperial mythology confirms the West's inability to engage in a genuine, quote, coming to terms with the past, and does not augur well for the future. End section.